Thank you. So most of you are probably not transplantation specialists or, or uh, clinical immunologists in this room, but uh, I always like to start by, I have the opportunity to stand up here and tell you about all the wonderful stuff that we do. The two individuals uh, shown on the right are, are responsible for essentially all of the work that I'm gonna show you today. Uh, so on the right is Maureen Montgomery, on the left is Roseanne Pedaroya, uh, and we have a collaborator, Chang Lee, at uh, WashU who did some of the bioinformatics uh, work that I'll talk to you about. So to start, I uh, want to talk to you about transplantation and kidney transplants are obviously the dominant transplant that occurs in the United States. Uh, this is what I'm showing you here is some data from the, uh, I think that's 1969 New England Journal article uh, from Paul Tarasaki's group showing the value of what's called uh, cross-matching, where we take recipient serum, we take donor cells, you mix the two together and see if there's a reaction. Uh, highlighted here, it's uh, shown in the box with basically the, the data they published showing that there are people who had a positive cross-match uh, is indicative of a, a worse outcome in those patients. Uh, and this has been one of the most cited papers uh, within clinical immunology and transplantation nearly over uh, a thousand times this paper's been cited. And this became the basis of pre-transplant testing for kidney patients in the United States. Every patient who gets a kidney tr transplant has a cross match in some fashion done prior to receiving that organ. So there's a couple of options for cross matches that a uh, particular lab can do. So on the, the left of this slide is sort of where we began. That's Paul Tarasaki's development is the CDC cross match assay that's there that's complement dependent and it goes through you can see here listed of various steps in that assay from there we sort of moved to flow cytometric cross matching uh, which obviously uses flow cytometry uh, and i described the principle it's patient antibodies donor lymphocytes mix the two together look on a flow cytometer for a positive reaction and where we've gone now is sort of looking at what's called virtual cross matching where we in the lab already know uh, the patient's antibody reactivity. So we have this before they come up uh, for a particular donor. Uh, the donor uh, then gets HLA typed at a local HLA institution, and then we can compare those two together. So if I'm a particular patient and I'm getting a kidney from one of you, they know your HLA type. I know the HLA types that I should react against based my, on my antigen, uh, single antigen bead assay that's shown on the the sort of bead assay, it's a luminex-based assay, we can compare those two and sort of predetermine whether or not that's a good match. If it's not, we essentially decline that offer and it goes on to another, uh, another donor on that list there. And so this relies on a couple of things, obviously the patient's antibody profile, as well as the donor HLA type, uh, as well as some factors that we're gonna talk about today, like we believe uh, HLA expression playing a role in and so this leads to sort of like the global assessment. So this is actually a working group within sort of our community that have put this out uh, recently. Uh, this is a STAR working group where they have uh, gone through the various iterations of technology that are available. Uh, and if you have a negative or positive and sort of the immunologic risk that it portrays for a particular patient. Uh, and where we're mostly gonna talk about as most centers fall into the the scenario we won't trust transplant across a positive flow cross match it means they're all going to be negative um, and sort of way the trend seems to be going is we seem to be less and less likely to even do it if there's any uh antibodies present I mean the third column now has to also be negative um, that are there uh, and sort of reducing the risk to patients letting organs last longer uh, in particular patients and so one of the hypotheses that we've had to try to evaluate uh, understand the cross-match reaction is trying to evaluate the relative HLA expression on donor lymphocytes uh, in the cross-match assay. Since this is essentially the assay that determines if that patient will go forward with transplantation, uh, at least immunologically, there's a number of other medical factors that determine it, but immunologically, this is one of the main ones. If it's positive, it goes on, as I said, to someone else. So. Uh, this is a group out of Hopkins data where they basically looked at different sources of lymphocytes, peripheral blood, spleen, lymph node, uh, and showed that if you look at various deceased donors, uh, that the HLA level expression varies, that this uh, has a correlation with the cross-match outcome um, there, and then by extension, uh, 
this will impact whether or not that patient actually proceeds to transplant. And I'm highlighting on the right on the slides the fact that T cells express HLA class one, B cells express HLA class one and HLA class two. So they act as the cells that we're going to analyze in a, in a flow cross match for these reasons. So there's a lot of ways you could do expression analysis. And when we submitted this paper for publication, the reviewers were quick to point that out. Um, and that why didn't we just do some sort of flow based protein based uh, evaluation. The problem is that there is not a lot of monoclonal antibodies, right? HLA is highly polymorphic, right? So there's not enough monoclonal antibodies to cover each of the specific alleles or classes if you just want to go globally. So that's really not a very good uh, option for us. The second one uh, is by the time we're doing flow cytometry cross matches, we've already gotten donor material. There's been enough delay in a transplant already, so it's not time efficient uh, either. And so that led us to try to look at sort of molecular-based, transcript-based expression, and we'll, we'll get into that in a second. So obviously pointing out that there's not a direct linear relationship here, right? Just because you have transcript levels that are high does not correlate. I mean, exactly, you're going to have protein levels that are high. There's post-transcriptional regulation, for example, right, that impacts this. Uh, our point of view and what we have been pushing is that you can do uh, molecular-based expression determination at the same time a lab is doing genotyping. We're already required, federal regulations require that we do genotyping on donors. So this sort of RNA-based assay would enable us to do two things at once, genotype and expression uh, there. And you can do another, a, a bunch of different uh, quantitative measures to sort of understand allele specific that would enhance our ability to do virtual cross-match uh, assessment. Now, you'll see sort of Highlighted here is that can it be done fast enough for deceased donors? So remember, we're in, the, we're in a time crunch in this scenario. We basically have to go from receipt of specimen in lab to reporting out results uh, to our organizations within like a six to seven hour time period, uh, all in. That means extraction, analysis, the whole kit and caboodle has to be done uh, in there. What we'll talk about was not done in that time frame, but we have some ideas of how we can get there. So what I'm going to talk about is sort of the proof of concept work we've done doing uh, whole transcriptome analysis using Nanopore for gene HLA genotyping and expression uh, analysis. So to do this, we basically took the sort of baseline approach for the flow cytometric cross match. We took negatively selected lymphocytes, so T cells, B cells, NK cells, uh, all in there. Uh, we magnetically isolate the mRNA. We did, we, worked out of various steps to sort of clean that up and allow us to concentrate and purify and use that as the input source into the uh, C PCR cDNA sequencing kit that's offered uh, and then prepare that for, for sequencing. And you can see the, some of the data analysis pipelines that we've used. And so uh, every sample was basically sequenced for about 18 hours. That was to give us uh, enough reads there. And you'll just see that these are samples uh, first one on the left is the total number of reads. Middle is percent is uh, reads mapped. Uh, this is all published in there as well. Uh, so on the right, you also have the ones the reads that mapped uh, specifically to the class one locus. Now you'll notice that I left off the entire class two locus, and that's because if you take uh, peripheral lymphocytes, T cells make up the dominant proportion in, in your peripheral T uh, lymphocytes, right? So. We tried to look at class two, but it, the expression is artificially lowered if you look if you use profile. Uh, and we have supplemental data in this paper shows that uh, as well. And then if you look at the total transcriptome reads and map, you can see that there are relatively very very small number uh, of reads there uh, that map to the HLA uh, genes. And so if you look at the class one expression uh, on the in A, you have the class one locus versus their TPM expression for uh, 10 or so donors, and each donor is a separate character. And you can see that the general trend, if you follow each marker, is generally B was high, HLA B was higher than HLA A, which was equivalent or just a little bit lower than HLA C. And so this is sort of what fits with what we were anticipating to see based on protein data. Uh, a, uh, B having a high level of expression followed by A and C falling there uh, a little bit behind that. Um, and then the question was, well, this is just one time point in time, right? And so this is what we would be doing for deceased donors, but how does it vary 
if you take the same individual and look a couple of days apart, is it the, does it remain consistent or how, because ideally we could just do this once, right? Uh, and see what kind of level variation are we expecting here. And so that's what's done in B. These are three separate individuals measured at three different time points. And you can see the, the pattern varies, not always greatly, but the pattern is essentially very consistent. Whatever was there on day one is the same thing we saw on day seven, for example. So then the question, right, we're required to do genotyping. Uh, so reference sequence was done by uh, our clinical pipeline that is done in our laboratory using uh, Lumina technology. Uh, we used um, a pipeline developed by Chang Lu, who's presented previously uh, at a Nanopore community meeting of his pipeline that he developed, um, shown there. And you can see the outline of how it is all done. I want to point out that it mostly just focuses on the core areas within the HLA genes that are there. Uh, we actually are able to downsample with this data. We downsampled to having a minimum of 200 HLA specific reads to get ac accurate genotyping. Shown in red are obviously the ones that are missed there. You'll notice all of them are HLA-C. You'll also notice that all of them have the reference typing of a C701 or a C0702. So at first I was like, oh man, that's unfortunate. Everything else worked. But you do a little bit of background, do a little bit of research, and you find out that the expression of C0701 and O02 uh, actually are known to have the lowest expression level. So our hypothesis is that those were the hardest to actually genotype based on having lower expression profiles uh, there, which uh, will be overcome with some of the future uh, applications that we're talking about. And so the whole point of this was to try to incorporate this into uh, some sort of cross-match assessment, right? The virtual cross-match part of this. So what we did is we I found uh, several serums that had only one uh, sort of target present in them. So you can see the serums listed there and their targets and their MFI, their mean fluorescent intensity, higher the number, the more reactivity, the more antibodies that are present. Um, took a number of donors that expressed that particular HLA and actually did physical cross-matches. So those cells were split and did mRNA, RNA-seq, and did cross-matching on the other arm, and looked at basically their expression versus their uh, T-cell or B-cell channel shift, their flow cross-match outcome, and that's what's shown here. And basically, for all, every single scenario, there were pretty qu high correlations between them. I think the lowest one is in like A, the B-cell did not have a strong correlation, it's like 0.5, uh, but you can see what, many of them are 0.94, that one was one, uh, for example, uh, there. And so for many of these, if you had the low, if a donor had a low molecular based expression, it had a low cross match outcome. If your donor had a high expression, it had a high cross match outcome. It's sort of what we would have predicted, which is why uh, it was sort of nice, but it also is the first step in the process to determining that uh, we can do this for deceased donors uh, going forward. Um, with that, I'm happy to take a question.